Hi everyone, this is Eric from Topaz Labs, and thanks so much for joining us on this webinar. I'm temporarily filling in for Nicole because of some unexpected circumstances, but I'm really excited to have Joel Wolfson here to show us his creative workflow with Topaz Plugins today. Joel Wolfson is best known for his artistic images and unexpected views of everyday places around the globe. His previous clients include Newsweek, Apple, and United Airlines, and his technical articles on digital imaging have been translated in more than 30 countries. Today, he's going to show you how he uses Topaz products in his creative workflow. So without any more delay, I'll hand it off to Joel. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Eric. Um, Hopefully you can see my screen now. And um, I want to thank you all for joining us. I'm, I'm really happy to be back. And uh, today I'm going to address creative workflow. I, I did cover a similar webinar more than a year ago. And there have been a lot of exciting changes and cool improvements in, uh, in the tools that we use for our images. And so um, I want to show you some of those today. Uh, two of my favorites that have made some really big improvements recently have been uh, black and white effects, um, brand new release just about a week ago, 2.1, and uh, there's some really cool stuff in there, so I'll be showing you some of that today. Um, another one is Detail, which is now on version 3, and that's a fairly recent update as well, and that actually has become one of my, uh, my go-to applications. I use it quite a bit. It's got a really nice interface in it, and and I prefer working in detail doing a number of other things besides just the detail enhancements. So um, we'll show you that too. And th there's another program that not, not everybody's all that familiar with um, that Topaz makes is Photo Effects Lab. Um, and that's sort of um, akin to programs like Lightroom and Aperture in the sense that it's a hub. Um, and it's a hub for plugins, and it's a really useful one. Um, it has layers, and you can change opacity. You can do some masking techniques, and it's it's just a really great hub for using all the Topaz plugins, of which I think there are about ten or twelve um, now. Um, so I'm going to show you these and how I use them. And um, in terms of in terms of talking about a workflow hub, as you can see, I've got Lightroom up here, and that's what I use, and that's where I import all my images and I do my basic adjustments in Lightroom. And um, then when I have something specialized or something I can do easier or better or faster using a plugin, um, then I'll hop out of Lightroom into that and I'll show you how that all kind of in integrates. But my goal really is just to be as efficient as possible and that allows me to spend less time in front of the computer and more time behind my camera. Uh, in terms of, I, I just kind of want to give a quick definition to workflow because you hear that word a lot and we're talking about creative workflow today. But basically, workflow I define as just um, a system that is efficient and it works for you. And your workflow is probably going to be a little different than mine. Um, and so it's really just a matter of, and, uh, and, and it's the whole idea is, is to get some efficiency out of this. So. Um, Part of that is how do you choose the right plugins for the job, essentially. Um, and really, what that boils down to is that spending time helps you save time. In other words, get to know um, the various plugins that you have or the software tools that you have, and then you can glean the most practical features from them. It's, it's not much different than when you buy a new camera and it's got hundreds of features, and you might use a handful of those are useful to you just because of the way you work. It's the same thing with the software. And I'm going to um, show you some of my favorites, and hopefully I'll give you a, a good head start on, uh, on creating some kind of efficiency in your creative workflow. Um, just to give you an example, um, if I know I'm going to be doing masking, um, I'll definitely use uh, Topaz because they have the best masking out there, I think. Um, for something really complex, I might use Remask. Otherwise, they've got some good masking tools built into Photo Effects Lab and Detail and some things like that. Um, I do most of my basic adjustments right in Lightroom, but Lightroom has um, a couple of nice tools in their develop module that are better than just about anybody else's shadows and highlights. So if, if, since I'm already in Lightroom to begin with, if, if um, I'm going to do those kinds of adjustments, I'll do them right in Lightroom. Uh, sharpening and creating depth, I'll use Detail 3. If I want to equalize tones or do single image HDR, um, then I'll be using adaptive exposure in black and white 
uh, effects or in adjust five. So um, that just gives you uh, that just gives you a quick idea of what I mean by all this. And um, I have also a little rule of thumb in terms of plugins because we not only have the question of what plugins do I use, but what do I use for a host application? Meaning, do I just go right into whatever plugin it is right from Lightroom or from Aperture, if I'm using Aperture or iPhoto, uh, whatever it is, um, or do I go into something like Photoshop or Photo Effects Lab? So here's my, my quick little rule of thumb. If you're only going to use one plugin and you know you're only going to use one plugin, just go right into it directly from Lightroom or Aperture or whatever your, your normal host program is. Um, the Topaz plugins, including um, Fusion Express, which allows you to go into all the Topaz plugins directly from um, an application works in a number of applications. So um, if you have Aperture, iPhoto, uh, Lightroom, whatever, you can go right from there. If you're going to use more than one plugin, um, and uh, then you, it's best to do it with layers. And so uh, for layers and masking and opacity and things like that, you can definitely use Photoshop, but lately I've been using Photo Effects Lab, and that's mainly because it has a simpler interface. So if I'm going to do um, adjustments other than, say, just having the layers to do multiple plugins, um, I like the adjustment interface a little better in Photo Effects Lab, and you'll see that when, when I show this later on in the presentation. Um, it just has an easier adjustment interface. Um, you can certainly use Photoshop if you have Photoshop. If you don't own Photoshop, it, as you know, if you price it, it's an expensive program, and that's another reason I like Photo Effects Lab is um, if you don't want to drop six or eight hundred bucks on Photoshop, you can use um, Photo Effects Lab. Um, I don't remember the exact cost, but I think it retails for around seventy or eighty dollars. And um, as Eric mentioned, uh, there'll be a coupon code if you like any of these plugins. You don't already own them. You can use the coupon code to get a, a fairly um, a fairly substantial discount um, at the end of this thing. So. Um, without further ado, I will um, I will start on some images. I'm going to start on this image right here. Um, this beautiful little girl, which happens to be my daughter, uh, reading a book in this look of intense concentration, uh, looking at the book. Uh, real simple shot, and I just want to show you how I how I can uh, create a a beautiful black and white portrait um, using black and white effects. So in this case, it's um, what I need to do is fairly simple. We we it's a nice you know it's a pretty nice shot to begin with. Um, the problem is when it's in color, um, there's some distractions because there's a lot of color around her, the book and um, Barb's sweater with the colored stripes and whatnot, and it and it's taking our attention a little bit away from her. You know, it's it's lit and it's composed such that that we're kind of uh, concentrating on her, but I but I think that'll be accentuated. Um, by making it black and white and by doing a couple of things in black and white effects. So, um, so here I am in Lightroom, and the way I, the way I'm going to hop from Lightroom into black and white effects is I just hover over the image, and I can do it right here in this view, or I can do it down in the thumbnail. In, in Lightroom, there's a film strip on the bottom here with thumbnails. So I right click. I happen to be on a Mac, and I have my mouse set up for right click. Um, if you don't have a right click on a Mac, you can use Option Click, and if you're on a PC, you do have a right click. Um, I go up to Edit In, and then I get another drop-down menu with some other options, and I'm going to go into this thing that I mentioned before called Fusion Express. Um, the first thing that happens is it asks me um, if I want to edit a copy with Lightroom Adjustments, and as a rule, you do want to edit a copy. You don't want to be editing your original, so that, that way you can always go back to your original if you need it. So here's what Fusion Express does. It just brings up a list of all the Topaz plugins that I have. And I'm going to um, pick black and white effects here. And then I hit run. And it should launch me right into black and white effects. And I get that nice little polite thing that says, please wait while I prepare the previews. So here we are in black and white effects. Um, <clears throat> And the interface is very similar to what you've uh, seen in other Topaz plugins. Uh, basically, we have presets on the right, uh, uh, sorry, on the left, and um, up on the top, they're divided into collections. And then whatever collection you've selected, like in this case, I have traditional selection, uh, traditional collection selected. Uh, below are the individual um, presets. 
Now, as I hover over the presets, you see this little pop out, and as I hover over, it changes to whatever that preset is. So presets are just um, combinations of settings that were done in black and white effects. Um, Topaz uh, provides these, and a lot of them are really useful. Um, you can also create your own. You notice on top it has my collection, so you can store your fav your um, your own in my collection. Then favorites can be either your own or ones um, that Topaz has provided. You see the ones with a blue star. You know, if I select this and click on the star, it makes it a, um, toggles it back and forth with the blue star, and then that makes it a favorite. So. Um, you can use these little pop-outs, but what I really like to use are the grids, and that shows me all of the different presets within a given collection at once. So I'm going to do that right now. Um, I'll go into, uh, on the right is where all the tools are and how we make all our adjustments, and I will be covering more of that as, as we go on here. So I'm going to click, um, if you follow my cursor to the upper left here, I'm going to click on that little grid icon, and this is really cool. It brings up everything in that collection, you see it says traditional collection up on top, and I can simply scroll through here and look for the conversion that I want. Now, black and white effects to uh, defaults to just a neutral um, conversion. Um, if I close out of here, you can see right there, that's, that's the neutral one. It's just called neutral grayscale. Um, but if I want something other than that, that's what I have all these presets for that I can cruise through. And if you created some of your own um, those you can look through those too. Um, I just want something a little warmer since this is a portrait and I like this warm tone one here so all I have to do is click on that and voila I have my my warm tone. Now what I notice when this comes up is there's sort of uh, some excess texture and that sort of thing. I'm really just looking for the tone I really don't want all that extra texture um, that's just part of the preset and it's no problem to um, change it back to just the tone. So What's happening there is we, we, you can see there's um, over on the right here where all these tools are. What I did is I went into the conversion mode first, and then under adaptive exposure, um, I can see that's what's happening right here basically in the, um, with, the, with all that texture. I can simply uncheck just the adaptive exposure, and I'm right back to my original lighting with just that warm tone, which is really, which is really just what I want. So these tools on the right are divided um, into sections. So the conversion is how you do your black and white conversion. You can adjust basic exposure. The adaptive exposure um, uh, exists also in Topaz Adjust 5. Um, there's all these different ones. And I will be covering some of those as we go on. In this case, I just wanted to remove it so that I just have the toning part of it. Now another thing that isn't um, immediately obvious is that it's also adding some film grain. So let me um, let me blow this up a little bit to one to one, and um, it's a little hard to see because the the uh, film grain that's chosen in this warm tone preset is a very fine grain film. Um, this the, the grain I'll just mention here as as um, an aside is um, something they've improved in this version. There are a whole bunch of different film grains, and as, as I understand it, Topaz actually has scanned in the grain pattern of all these films, so it's very accurate to these films. This happens to be a fine grain film. If I go to a, um, a heavier grain film, um, it, it just becomes a little more obvious. So I'm real, I really don't want any, so I'm just going to shut that off. Um, I don't know if you can see that very well on your screen, but when I turn it on, if you look at her face, you can see the texture and the grain. If I uncheck it, it goes away. So I don't really need the film grain for this. Again, all I'm just looking for is the toning. So I'm, I'm most of the way there. I really like the way this looks. Um, we've gotten rid of a lot of the distraction by just going with um, black and white here. Um, the other thing I want to do is I want to put a vignette on it so I can kind of darken the edges and really get the viewer's attention to, um, to the baby's face. So I'm going to go down to vignettes here. I'm going to scroll down. I'll close film grain because that's distracting me a little bit. It'll be easier for you guys to see this. So when I check on vignette, it goes to um, a default vignette, um, which is not exactly the way I want it. It's um, a little dark and a little small. What I do, the, I usually just use these top two sliders in the vignette um, dialog box here. Um, the 
the strength, a negative number makes it darker on the edges. So if I go way over here, um, a positive number makes it light on the edges. And we want to go dark on the edges. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to way overdo it just so I can see the shape of this vignette here, the size. And then I can, then I can move this around and tweak the size the way I want it. It's just easier to see um, when it's uh, sort of too dark like that. So I'm going to bring it up probably right around there. And then I'm going to change the strength back to something a little more reasonable. I don't want it quite this dark. I'll bring it up to oh, maybe 25-ish, something like that, um, up in this range. So um, now we have a nice vignette. Um, the viewer's attention goes right, right to her face, concentrating on this book. And we're not so distracted by some of the other elements. So um, about, all, about the only other thing I would want to do here is um, throw a border on there. And this is another really great improvement in Black and White Effects 2.1 is there are all kinds of borders on here. Now I happen to like this solid white because this is just you know supposed to be a simple portrait but um, and I'll show you using some of these other ones um, in another photo that I'm going to do um, later on at the end of the webinar. Uh, but you can see there's all kinds of, of, of neat uh, borders here. Black ones, white ones, you've got film edge look, a torn edge look, all kinds of stuff. Um, in this case I'm just going to go with the solid white. I like that. And uh, basically, in just just using a preset and a couple of clicks, um, a border and a vignette, I've I've got a really nice black and white portrait. So if I'm satisfied with this, which basically I am, I'm just going to say OK. And what's going to happen is it it's going to pop right back into Lightroom, and voila, there's there's my finished image. So. Let me, uh, I'll just do a quick comparison. Um, this is our before, and this is where we went. And I'll just compare those two for you so you can see. I'll make the screen a little bigger. So there you are. I think uh, it, it just really kind of simplified things by going to black and white. We got rid of a lot of those color distractions and just throwing a vignette on there. And we've got a really nice um, black and white portrait. Now, if I wanted to do any tweaks in this, I could still do some, you know, some tweaking adjustments in Lightroom, but I, I like it the way it is. So there's an example of just a, a really pretty quick and easy way to make a nice black and white portrait with, um, with black and white effects. And because I was just using one plugin, I went directly into it from Lightroom. So I want to go to another image now. And this is a color image, and this is kind of, kind of a, a funky image. I call this one Night Rider. And what this is, um, I shot this in Flagstaff, where I live. And uh, this is a, <laughs> a light painting, and this is a buffalo statue. So this is really, uh, just to explain it, it's a combination of three exposures. So the camera's on a tripod, for those of you who haven't done light painting. Camera's on a tripod. A long exposure, about two or three minutes, to to bring up the night sky and show the stars, and then I use a, essentially a flashlight with a red filter on it, and literally like a paintbrush, paint in the light on the buffalo. And then after I completed the painting on the buffalo, I had Barb get on the buffalo, um, and I had her do that at the end so that she would be sort of a slightly ghosted image. So the image of the buffalo is showing through her, and the, and the image of the sky is showing through her. So she's only part of the exposure. And then I used a white light instead of a filtered light for her. Um, light painting, if you've ever done it, isn't a super exact science. So although uh, with digital cameras being able to chimp on the back and, and preview your image, you can, um, you can get pretty close. But this image still needs to be tweaked a little bit. The sky isn't quite as um, bright or as vivid a blue as I would like. And I kind of want to enhance the detail on on the buffalo a bit. So um, what I'm going to do is um, use uh, detail and I'm going to use actually use it a couple times in layers and so I'll do that in Photoshop that's kind of kind of a standard and I could do it in Photo Effects Lab but I, I'm going to show you both today just so you get an idea. So we'll do Photoshop first and then the image after this I'll I'll do it in Photo Effects Lab so you can see the usefulness of that one as a as kind of a, a hub for plugins. So again, I do the right click 
and I go down to edit in and this time I'm going to say uh, select uh, Adobe Photoshop CS6 again it's going to ask me if I want to make a copy of this which I do I don't want to work on my original here um, if I've done any um, adjustments in Lightroom you can see it's saying copy with adjustments so that's what I'm going to do it's going to pop me into Photoshop here now the first thing I I always do when I'm dealing with a program that has layers and I'm going to be doing multiple things to it is I make a copy of the layer. And this is true whether I'm in uh, Photo Effects Lab or in this case if I'm in Photoshop. So the way I do this, um, if you look over on the lower right where my cursor is, that's um, where I have my layers and right now there's just one, the background layer. So I can, there's different ways to do this and, and especially in Photoshop there's usually three or four different ways to do the same thing. I'm just going to drag and drop it onto this little dog ear icon and that that makes a duplicate layer. You can also do this through menus and that sort of thing. Um, um, I've found this to be the quickest and easiest. And then those of you that have watched my webinars before know that I am a big fan of naming things. So I'm going to double click on this and I'm going to label it and I'm going to call this Detail 3 and that reminds me what plugin I used and then what I did to it, I'm going to adjust the sky. Okay. Now you may you may wonder if I'm if I'm going to um, if I'm going to do a brightness and saturation adjustment uh, adjustment, which is what I mentioned. Um, why not just do it in Photoshop? And the reason is well, there are two reasons. One is um, I like, and I'll show it in just a second. I like the uh, interface better in. Um, in detail uh, because it's sliders and I don't have to mess around with histograms and points on a curve and creating extra layers for it and all that sort of thing. Um, Photoshop you can basically accomplish anything you want. Now whether it's the most efficient way to do it or not is a whole other question and that's why plugins are so popular because oftentimes plugins are just a lot easier way to do it, a lot less tedious, a lot more intuitive, that sort of thing. So unless there's something Photoshop specific um, that only Photoshop can do, I'll generally use either Lightroom or a plugin for it. So, all that said, I've got my extra layer and I go up to the filter menu here and I'm going to go down to Topaz Labs and there are all my filters and I'm going to find Detail 3 right here and select it and um, just like we did from Lightroom, this will hop from Photoshop into um, the Detail plugin. So um, you can see the interface is very similar to black and white effects. We've got collections and presets over on the left. We've got all of our adjustments over on the right. Um, and in this case, we have um, a navigator uh, in the upper right here too. So here's my image, and um, I'm going to start doing adjustments on it. And I'm going to save the detail adjustments for another layer, so you'll see that in just a few minutes. What I'm going to do is scroll down to the um, toning part of this right here and I'm going to adjust my sliders to accentuate the sky. So the first thing is it needs a little more saturation. Now I'm going to adjust the saturation. Now you can see I'm adjusting the saturation on the whole image but we're going to take care of that in a minute. And I'm going a little crazy here. Um, I do not want the buffalo to look like that but what we're going to do is mask out the sky. And because Topaz has such great masking tools, that's the reason I'm doing these adjustments in detail. As I mentioned, you could do them in Photoshop, you could saturate the image in Lightroom. Um, the masking in Lightroom just doesn't work as well as the masking in Topaz. So um, here we are, we've got a way oversaturated photo. And I want to mention I go a little bit more than I usually feel is going to be necessary because I'm working in a layer. So whether I'm in Photo Effects Lab or Photoshop, I can always back off the opacity on that layer and lessen the effect if I want it. Um, so it's better, I think, to have it just be a little bit more than you need. Um, you can always back it off later and it saves possibly having to go back into a plugin or somewhere else and redo what you've done because you didn't do enough. So um, I'm up in the saturation. I want to lighten the sky a little bit. So I'm going to also um, bring my exposure slider up here. Again, I'm going to go probably a little bit more than I really need just in case. Um, and the sky looks good, the rest of it looks awful, but we're going to take care of that. And the way we do that is with masking. So 
excuse me, what I'm going to do here is you see at the top of these adjustments over on the right, all these sliders, there's this tab that says effect mask. And that allows us to um, mask out um, and uh, conversely keep whatever we want. So basically, I'm going to invert the mask first. So now the mask is all black. We're back to where we started. There's no effect whatsoever. Um, so when the mask is black, it's blocking the whole thing. When it's white, um, it's revealing it 100%. And if it's gray, it's somewhere in between. And you can uh, selectively brush this back in, which is what I'm going to do. So these controls here over on the right below the uh, little thumbnail of the mask here are how I adjust the tools. Now, when the strength is zero, it's not going to it's not going to reveal anything. When it's over to one, it's essentially 100%. So when I start to brush in, it'll brush it in 100% white. Um, I can pick a fairly large brush because I'm just working on the sky. Um, the hardness is just a feather. That's pretty typical of almost any program like Photoshop, Lightroom, etc. The flow is how <clears throat> how fast the effect comes through the brush. I'm going to put that up at 1.0, which is 100%. Now, this is really the cool part of this, and that's the edge aware. I'm going to put that at 100%. And essentially, what edge aware does is I have this little crosshair, which is like um, the little bullseye in this brush, and whatever whatever that's whatever I click on and sample that's in the center, um, it's going to remember that tone and uh, color and just brush that out. So here I'm going to start brushing the sky, and when I get to some edges, you're going to see what happens. Like I get near the buffalo, and as long as I keep that crosshair um, in the blue part, it won't affect the buffalo. That's what the edge aware does. It knows the buffalo is red, different color and different tone than the sky, and you can see it's just wrapping right around there. In fact, I'm just going to blow this up so you can see what it does, and I'll make the brush a little smaller. So it's easier to see. So again, I'm keeping it in the blue, and it's just wrapping right around everything here. And you notice the my rider here, she's um, she's translucent. Remember, I I ghosted her when I when I did this, and it's it's still maintaining that ghosting, which is really cool. And look at this, right around the pine needles on these trees. I mean, this thing is awesome. And if um, if I really want to tweak it, I can go under the belly of the buffalo here, make sure the crosshair is in the blue, and get that part too. So um, I'm going to shrink this down, make sure I didn't miss anything. I guess I did miss some patches in here over on the right. And there's a little bit on the left here. Now if you look at my mask, there's a few black dots. Those are the stars that it maintained. And um, again, if I go to one-to-one, -to -one, just um, take, take a look at how how clean the edges are. Now if I do a before, um, I'm holding down the space bar by the way, which is a shortcut to get um, a before your before image, and then when I let go, you get the after image. And you can see um, how nice and clean the masking is. I'll go over to the trees here, and you can see it just wrapped right around those trees. So I don't know of any other tool that's, that's so easy and so quick to do a mask like that. I use this all the time for things like landscapes to um, do skies and that sort of thing. All right, so um, I'll go back to fitting this in. We can take a quick look. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. There's my before, there's my after, and I just wanted to adjust the sky, and so that's what I did. And when I say, okay, it'll um, pop us back into uh, Photoshop here, and there's my layer with the, de with the sky that I did in Detail 3. If I check the eyeball, click the eyeball, uncheck the layer, you can see the before and after. So now I want to work on the detail itself, kind of um, on the sharpness. Before I do that, um, I do think the sky is just a little bit overdone, so I want to show you what I meant about the opacity on the layer. So now this layer is selected. If you go to the lower right with me where my cursor is, and um, there's an opacity slider right here. If I click on that, I can, I can move this slider to all different levels, and you can see um, if I go all the way to zero, there's no effect. As I bring it up, it slowly, as I move this, it brings up the sky. So I'm going to back it off just a little bit because it's just a little too intense for me. And remember, I did that on purpose. So now with the slider, and, I, and you can do this in Photo Effects Lab as well, um, I can really tweak it to exactly the effect I want on that layer, um, which is a really nice feature of having layers. 
So now that said, I, I do want to work on the detail of this, um, um, the sharpness. I want to get a little more detail in that buffalo um, and get a little more sense of depth. It's just a little bit two-dimensional, especially the rider. Um, she could use a little more dimension to her, and, and detail is really great for that, the Detail 3 plugin. So uh, I'm going to create a new layer. And what I'm going to do here, um, again, there's different ways to do this, but in Photoshop, I hold down the Option key, Alt on a PC, click on this little drop-down menu, and you have Merge Visible. Um, what the Option key does is it creates a new layer. So basically what it did is it merged all the layers underneath it, created a new one that makes a combination of those, which is what I want. So I want that sky, just how I tweaked it, and that's going to be the starting point now for Detail 3, where I want to add depth and sharpness and I, I just make put that description right in the right in the layer so if I ever want to go back to it I know what I did so again we go um, up here on the top um, to the filter menu and scroll down to Topaz Labs and I go into detail 3 so we're going right back into the same program now the reason the reason I hopped out and back in again um, is because uh, I had that mask and now I want to be applying uh, the detail to a different, uh, the controls to a different part of the image. Um, if I had tried to do it in that one, within just that one layer, um, it only would have affected the sky because that's all, I, I had everything else masked out. Now, it looks ridiculous again. What happened is um, with most of these plugins, when you go into them, it will default to whatever your previous settings were. So I make a habit whenever I go into these to go down to, it's usually in the lower right here, there's a reset button. And so I reset it um, back to my starting point. And what I'm going to do is magnify this so that we can see the detail, so you can see what's kind of happening here. And I'm, uh, I'm just going to add some uh, sharpness to this. So here's, um, I like the presets they have in detail. I've got a lot of really good ones. Um, usually I'll start with the micro contrast and um, one is gives me just a little bit. I think I want a little more than that, so I'm going to go to two. Again, this is a preset, so it's um, it's a combination of settings. And basically, the micro contrast um, presets. If you look over on the right, we're just affecting the small detail. Now, you notice what happened is um, there's small detail and there's boost. Now, in deep de in detail. Um, it breaks the detail down. It's really cool. So it breaks it down into small, medium, and large detail. And then within each one of those, um, uh, there's a boost setting. So what the boost does is it works on the, um, the less affected parts of that type of detail. So in the small detail, it's affecting the really small detail. And you can see what happened is I gained some noise in the sky. And I'll show you a little trick uh, for this, and that is you can still have your small detail but not have it affect detail that you really don't want like such as noise. Now I shot this at about an ISO of 800 you normally don't see that much noise but with the boost on you do. So if I bring this boost slider down I'm going to just um, bring it down to about zero. A shortcut to that is you double click um, on the name and it goes to its default. So I'll hold down the space bar so you can see the before. There's the before. Now take a look at the buffalo and the detail in it, and then take a look at the sky too. When I let go, um, I don't I don't have much of the grain, but I still have all that detail in the buffalo, and I actually have more stars. I can see more stars in the sky, but I don't have the grain really affecting that much. So there's the before. I'm still holding down the space bar, and there's the after. And if you want to play around with this boost to find the sweet spot between not showing any noise and um, you know seeing these stars um, it's 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 kind of a, a neat tool to sort of have your cake and eat it too as far as the detail is concerned so um, that gives me that gives me some sharpness now I also um, I also want to add a little depth to this and in that case um, especially in the rider um, now you notice there isn't as much fine detail there as there is in the buffalo. So for that, I'd probably want to use the medium detail. And a, a quick way to do that is with feature enhancement. But before I do that, I want to apply what I've done. Now what, if you go to the lower right, follow my cursor down here to the lower right, um, there's this apply button. That will apply whatever I've done up to this point, and that will be my new baseline. 
So that will be my new starting point. So when I when I click on before, hold down the space bar to look at before, this will be my new starting point. And that's what I want because I don't want to change yet. I think that amount of sharpness and detail is perfect. But now I'm going to go over to the left here and I'm going to go to Feature Enhancement and click on that. And it's fairly, um, it's fairly subtle, but if you look over at what happened to my controls on the right, it's affecting just the medium and large detail, not the small detail at all. At all. But if I do the before here, I'm going to do that right now, take a look at the rider and take a look at the detail and the sense of depth as soon as I go back to the after. It's fairly subtle, but it adds a nice sense of depth um, overall, and that's exactly what I want. Um, and I might just take the boost down again so I don't affect the stars, but I still have that sense of depth. So now I'm done. I'm going to say OK. And let's make this smaller so you can see the whole thing. Um, and I'm going to go back, I'm going to uncheck these layers. So this is where we started. Take a look at the sky. That's where we ended up. I'm going to blow it up also so that um, you can take a look at the buffalo here. Let's go to um, let's go to about 50%. I think you'll be able to see that. So there's before, there's after. We have the sky, we've got all that detail, and we have a much better sense of depth. And I'll do that one more time at 100% here. So um, there's where we started, and there's where we ended up. Voila. So let's see. I've got, I think, enough time to do one more image. Excuse me, I was just getting a drink of water there. And um, for this next one, I'm going to do a landscape. Uh, and I want to show um, black and white effects again. We'll go, I'll go into some more of the controls. And, and uh, let me pop back into Lightroom. And we're going to use this image here which I just shot um, about a week ago. And this is, uh, this is called Grand Falls. It's also sometimes called Mud Falls because the, you can tell by the color of the water, it's, it's very muddy. And this is about 30 miles from my studio. Um, it was an overcast day, but very dramatic clouds. And uh, um, I pretty much knew I was going to do a black and white while I was shooting it. It's kind of monochromatic anyway. Um, you know, there are shots you can do to accentuate uh, the, the muddy color and use it to your advantage, but in this case I want to do a black and white and I'm going to do a sepia tone with it. So here I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be using uh, black and white effects and I, as my host application I'll use uh, Photo Effects Lab. I'll also be using detail, so I'm going to try to, uh, in a few minutes here, sort of combine a lot of these things I'm talking about so you can see um, uh, more things involved in this uh, creative workflow. So the first thing I'm going to do actually is go into the develop module in Lightroom. Again, we're talking, about, we're we're looking at efficiency. So if if I can um, if I can make some adjustments on this thing um, in Lightroom, I might as well do it. I'm already in here. It's more efficient than having to use an extra plugin or an extra application like Photoshop to do adjustments. So um, it's uh, we got a couple things going on here. It's a little low contrast, kind of a low contrast day. Not to mention this is from a raw file, and the raws really don't um, they tend to look flat to begin with anyway. So over on the right are my tools. It's actually uh, not a dissimilar layout from uh, Topaz plugins. Um, what I'm going to do is um, I could use the contrast slider, but what I like to do first is come down to the uh, curves tool here. And under point curve, there's a drop-down menu with uh, sort of standard, medium, and strong contrast. And I'll try those. Um, there's strong. That's a little too strong. I'm going to go probably with the medium here. So that adds a little contrast. Um, the whole thing is maybe just, um, just a tiny bit dark, too, um, especially in the shadows. Now, here's a slider that I think works particularly well in Lightroom and that's the shadow slider because it affects just the shadows. So as I move this, see if I move it all the way over, it is just affecting the shadows. It's not touching the highlights at all. So what I want to do is just uh, uh, bring up these shadows uh, maybe to about there just so it's uh, a little bit better balanced. So um, 
if I go back in my history to where I started, kind of flat, still dramatic clouds, but I want to um, fill in those shadows and just make it a little bit snappier. Now, I, I'm, I'm still going to accentuate those clouds a little more, but I'm going to wait until I get into, um, into detail and black and white effects to kind of to kind of uh, tweak these things. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, launch into Photo Effects Lab. Now, <clears throat> again, I want to edit a copy. Now, Photo Effects Lab again very similar uh, interface to what you see in all the Topaz plugins, and as I mentioned, even Lightroom. Uh, but as far as the plugins. We do have over on the left, there's little preview images, but again, it's presets. Um, the difference with Photo Effects Lab, this is, when I say it's a hub for plugins, if you look up at the top left, follow my cursor to the top left, um, I click on plugins, there's all these different tabs. I'm not going to go into all of them. Uh, if you want to learn about everything this program can do, there's a lot of good information on um, Topaz's website. I'm going to um, again show you how this fits into the workflow. So we'll mostly be using this plugins tab here, but you certainly can save off presets from. And what's cool is you can save off presets from all different plugins, and that's what this effects tab is. You can see if you look, this one is adjust five. This one was done with clean. This was done with black and white effects, adjust, etc. So, um, but we're going to be concentrating on. The plugins, and then on the opposite side, we're going to be working with the layers, just like we did in Photoshop. So I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can because we're getting close to uh, Q and A here. I'll just try to do it in a few minutes. So the first thing I want to do is duplicate the layer. I'm going to relabel this clouds, um, and I'm going to be doing this right from within uh, Photo Effects here. Um, this dynamic slider. Um, sort of equalizes tones. It's a little bit like a one slider sort of instant HDR. And really what I'm just looking at is the clouds here. So I want to just accentuate the clouds a bit and uh, and I'm also going to lighten the exposure just a tiny bit. And I want to isolate the clouds. So one of the reason one of the great things about Photo Effects Lab is like again the masking tools. Now in this program it's upper right here. I hit mask and the interface is the same as before. Um, I'm going to invert the mask so there's no effect now um, and then I'm just going to brush in my effect and again I'm going to make take advantage of that great edge aware and I'm just going to brush in the sky and remember as long as I keep that cursor over the area that I want it to isolate it's going to isolate it and you know there we are a few seconds later and we've got a beautiful mask and effect of just the sky on it. So I'm going to make a new layer and I'm going to say from stack that's the same uh, the equivalent of what we did in Photoshop where it's making a new layer from a combination of the other ones and uh, we're going to call this black and white effects sepia. All right, now I'm going to launch into black and white effects. And it's saying, please wait, very polite. First thing I'm going to do is reset because it has the same options as we used last time, which was the portrait um, of my daughter. And uh, <clears throat> I want to do something toned. So I'm going to go to my tone collection because I want to do a sepia. And uh, I'll find a good preset here. Um, guess what I like best? Sepia by Joel. So this is a preset I made on my own. And uh, I may have to reset it again here to get it to apply. There we go. So that gives me, and basically this preset I just made from, do you see these little droplets up here in the quick tools? Gives you all different kinds of tones. And um, if you hover over, it tells you what it is, sepia, copper, etc. So I, I just modified a sepia tone. And the other thing I want to do here is um, put on a vignette. Now I'm just going to show you real quick a new tool. And this is the zone mapping. And I use this. It gives you the zone system tones from um, 0 to 9, which is pure black to pure white and everything in between. And I just kind of want to check. There should always be a pure white and a pure black. So I'm just doing a check here. Um, it color codes it when I 
select the zero you can see over here in the center um, uh, on, the, on the right side of the image um, I've got a pure white um, when I click on this I've got a pure black it's a little hard to see I'll blow it up so you, you can see it uh, and basically that purplish color coded mapped there so I know I have my blacks and whites and everywhere in between it's kind of a nice little check um, I wish I had more time to go into the zone system stuff but um, not this time around and let's go back to our normal I'm gonna throw on a vignette here kind of give it an old old-fashioned look I want kind of it's kind of a timeless thing um, and then the other thing I'm gonna do just as a final touch here is I want to put on a border and my favorite for this type of thing is the grungy black and white too and that gives it kind of a film edge look and of course um, you can move this slider and adjust you know how much border you put on there so I think that looks great I'm going to say OK, go back into Photo Effects Lab. And uh, the other thing I'm going to do just real quick here is, um, again, I'll create a new layer from the stack. And I'm going to call this Sharpen. I think I'm going to call it Sharpen if I can highlight it. And uh, let me just blow this up a little bit. And I'm just going to add a little overall, a little overall sharpness to the image with the slider. So here we go. Uh, whoops. I put my layer in the wrong place. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I just meant to click the eyeball here so you can see before the sharpening, there's after the sharpening. Um, and then I'll go back down to the original size and you can see where we started. Okay, and that's where we ended up. So pretty cool. Um, very easy, uh, very powerful tools. Um, and it looks like we're getting really down on the time here, so I would like to leave a little time for question and answer. Great. Thanks so much, Joel. That was uh, very interesting, and the photos are amazing. Um, so okay. right now, yeah, just go ahead and type in if you have any questions. We'll probably only have time to go over a couple of them. But, uh, yeah, let us know what you think about the webinar right now. Um, Joel, we do have a couple of questions already. So okay. one, one of them is... Um, when you use a black and white effect, do you still do any color corrections in Lightroom beforehand? That uh, that's a very good question. Uh, um, I don't know who asked that, but whoever did, that's a good question. And um, yes, I do. And my my rule of thumb is if you're going to convert to black and white. Um, now this this image I just did of the waterfall was kind of monochromatic to begin with so it's a little bit of an exception I did I did play around with the contrast a little bit but I would say a good rule of thumb when you're when you're starting with a color image is if it looks a little bit too gaudy and a little oversaturated it will probably make a good conversion to black and white um, black and white is all about tones and contrast and um, although it may not look too pleasant in the um, in the color mode when you switch it to black and white when you go into black and white effects and start looking at your conversions um, they'll generally be a lot better if you start out a little bit oversaturated a little bit over contrasty on the color image so I hope that answers your question okay great um, and Ruth asks how much do you do in camera raw before saving um, or is most of your processing done in Topaz and Photoshop uh, Ruth, good question. Um, uh, Lightroom is actually has all the same controls as Camera Raw, and I do shoot everything in Raw. So everything I'm doing, um, if you can still see my screen over on the right here, um, if you've seen Adobe Camera Raw, these will all look very familiar. And so um, it's non-destructive editing in both Lightroom and Camera Raw, and I do um, basically um, as much as I can uh, in in Lightroom or or if you're using Camera Raw, it'd be the same thing. Um, as I mentioned before, some things um, are 
are more efficient other ways. You know, if I'm going to do a black and white conversion and sepia tone and all that sort of thing, um, some of that I can't even do in camera raw, and some of it is just better done in black and white effects or something like that. But um, uh, basic things like exposure, uh, contrast. Um, I really like the highlight and slider controls in Lightroom, which is also the same as Camera Raw. Um, I used to like the Clarity slider, but they they made it worse in the in the latest iteration, and so I really love detail for um, for adding depth and sharpness. So I hope that answers your question, Ruth. That was a good question. All right, thanks, Joel. And yeah, more, Eric. The uh, we we also have um, one second. Okay, so Gloria asks, what are the benefits of shooting color to convert to black and white as opposed to just shooting it in black and white in the camera? Uh, good question. Now, if, if you're shooting in RAW, you're shooting in color anyway. Now, a lot of cameras, if you're shooting in RAW, you can go into your picture control. Uh, you know, Nikon and Canon manufacturers, different manufacturers call it different things, but but whatever whatever picture control is called on your camera, um, you can go in there, set it to black and white, even if you're shooting raw. And what happens is you're still shooting a raw image, you're still capturing color information, but the image you see on the LCD, which is generated by a JPEG actually, is black and white. And I suggest that to people as a way to sort of pre-visualize. I guess I should say just visualize your black and white. Um, the the only advantage uh, uh, the advantage of sh shooting a color image and then converting it to a black and white is um, a lot of programs uh, work on the color information. So um, even though you're seeing a black and white image, uh, the program knows that there's blue underneath there for the sky. So you can um, move your controls, let's say in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, um, and adjust. Um, just the sky and make it darker because you have that color information there. If you start with, if you shoot JPEG only and you start with a black and white, so if you put your camera on JPEG only and set it for black and white, that's all you'll get is black and white. So then the conversion is happening in the camera and you don't have as much control over it. So even if you know you're shooting black and white, I usually do recommend capturing it in color and capturing it in RAW. Okay. And um, this is probably the last question that we have time for, but Arlene asks, which Topaz product do you use most frequently? Oh, that's a great question, Arlene. <laughs> um, you know, that I have to admit that that changes over time, but I would say that my sort of go-to applications, uh, uh, plugins for Topaz, well, I use Photo Effects Lab, uh, because I like uh, when I have to do layers, so I use that as kind of my hub for the plugins. Um, because I like the inter the interface is faster for me than Photoshop, um, unless I have to do something that only Photoshop can do, like say content aware cloning or something like that. Um, I'll I'll use Photo Effects Lab as my hub. As far as the favorite plugins, I would say Detail Three, Adjust Five. Um, and black and white effects are probably my three go-to. Now, when I have to do complex masking, um, there's nothing better than remask. And um, I hope to be doing a, a webinar on that in the future with you guys. Um, I've talked talked about it with Nicole, so maybe maybe uh, if you're on the Topaz mailing list, um, you'll be notified of that. But those are th those I'd say are are really the most versatile. App, um, of the plugins, you know, in terms of having a lot of different uses and being uh, more efficient than than other ways of doing it. So that was a good question, Arlene. Thanks. Hey, thanks so much, Joel. If you want to see more of Joel's excellent work, go to his website, uh, joelwolfson.com, and you can also read some of his thoughts on photography on his blog. And there's also his direct contact information right there. So thanks so much for joining us on the webinar. Um, it was really fun, and I personally learned a lot from Joel. So thank you very much, Joel, and see you next time. Thanks. Well, you're welcome, and thank you.